doing? Not a thing. You know, it's getting me down eating in these hamburger joints. One thing you gotta learn, eat where the truck drivers eat. They know the right spot. Say, I saw a funny thing up the road just now. Good-looking dame sitting in a car all alone. Yeah, what was she doing? That's just it. She wasn't doing nothing, just sitting there. I got a rule about women. If they ain't breaking the law, let them alone. I didn't mean to disturb you, miss. Just wanted to be sure everything was okay. Excuse me, lady, but are you sure you're all right? Is she? Luckier than she deserves. I just checked on her up the road. She was acting kind of strange then. I'd better call that ambulance. I doubt if it's serious, and I'm as good a doctor as you'll find at this time of night. Let's take her inside. Well, no bones broken. Bruises, that's all. I think you'd better rest here for the night. I'm a little surprised. You're a beautiful young woman. You've been in an accident. You haven't asked for a mirror. Perhaps that fits with the way you were driving tonight. Perhaps you find the idea of living not very attractive. Is that any of your business, Doctor? As a matter of fact, it is my business. I happen to be a psychiatrist. I don't need a psychiatrist. You won't mind if I disagree with you. Here's a beautiful young woman, apparently well-to-do apparently in good physical condition, who just doesn't care what happens to her. This is interesting. Not altogether unusual, but interesting. Of course, there are the obvious deductions. It's my life, Doctor, and I prefer to run it myself. And you don't want anyone to see inside it. Perhaps you don't even want to take a look yourself. Many women haven't the courage to face themselves, so they look for escape in one excitement after another. Half my patients are like that. But I'm not one of your patients. If you tell me how much I owe you, I'll, I'll be going back to town now. Very well. I'll drive you to the station. Miss Damien, you're an intelligent woman, not an idiot. Will you promise me one thing? When you get ready to throw yourself off Brooklyn Bridge, will you come and see me first? Just what is our trouble? That's what I want to know. Our trouble is Miss Damien. Miss Damien again. She's as pretty as a picture and as stubborn as a mule. But this time, there's a lot more involved than just her opinion.
Come in, Miss Damien. We were just ripping you up back a little bit. So I gathered. There's nothing personal. It's about Mr. Cortland. Cortland? Oh, yes. He runs a jewelry store. He owns Cortland and Company. London, Paris, Fifth Avenue. You may remember him as one of our biggest advertisers. Oh, what Shirley wants to say... I know what Shirley wants to say. I always know what Shirley wants to say. He wants to know why I killed the art layout on Mr. Cortland's famous jewels. And I understand the April number goes to press without it. That's right. In the first place, it's no art layout. It's a press agent's dream. But the result is we stand a good chance of losing the Cortland account. Now, am I running my department or am I not? I haven't said anything, Miss Damien. Well, I had a talk with Cortland. He was decidedly acid about it. I'm not interested in Cortland. But if this magazine is going to submit to advertisers blackmail, I'd like to know about it. Now, please, Miss Damien. If that's the policy, Mr. Cranish, you better get someone else to take my place. Please, Miss Damien, just a moment. Gentlemen, if you don't mind, I'll talk to you later. I thought I should bring this to your attention. You can't blame us for trying it. No, no, of course not. No harm done, gentlemen. Madeline, you've got yourself all worked up. Come sit down. I'll get you a drink. No, thanks. I don't want one. No? What is this private blackmail of yours? Threatening to quit in order to win an argument? Oh, I'd just as soon quit. I mean it. Now, now, tell me. What's happened? You're all wound up. What, what's bothering you? Oh, nothing's bothering me. You know I don't want you to quit. I won't go into my personal feelings, but you are the best art editor we've ever had. How's the insomnia? Oh, I found some new sleeping pills. Red ones this time. Red pills to put you to sleep. White pills to wake you up. Doesn't sound very sensible, my dear. What are you doing this evening? Dining with Freddie Fancher. Oh, Freddie again. Oh, I couldn't get out of it, Victor. We're using some of his drawings next month. But it'll be the last time, I promise. Madeline, you're a bundle of lies. A very lovely bundle, beautifully tied together. I'm trying to be honest, but you won't believe me, will you? <laughs> no, my dear. Because I don't really think you believe yourself. You haven't even given me a chance to make love to you. You've been doing all right. You know something? It's awfully hard making love to a woman who makes more money than I do. It'd be much easier if you made love to me. Would it? Oh. You're trying to give me the brush off, are you? Well, finally, we understand each other. Well, there you are, Freddy. There's your girl and no bones broken. I'll see you at the office, Madeline. I'd join you if somebody asked me. Nobody's asking. Fair enough. Why do you have to dance with that polywog? Look, I've told you not to drink. I always drink, particularly when I'm with you. Oh, am I that hard to take sober? You're a voluptuous pain in the neck. I'm going home. You're not going to walk out on me. Come on, be yourself. I told you I'm going to leave early. But you can't leave me just sitting here in the snow. I'm mad about you. In my own foul way. <laughs> Good night, Freddy. Any chance of getting a cab, Jim? I'll try, Miss Damien. Oh, Miss Damien, here's someone I know you're anxious to meet. Mr. Felix Cortland, one of our most prominent advertisers. How do you do, Miss Damien? How do you do? Mr. Garrett is the soul of tact, don't you think? He's just been telling me all about you. Oh, I hope he wasn't that blunt. Oh, you needn't worry. I always form my own conclusions. Can I give you a lift anywhere? My car's just outside. No, thank you. They're getting me a cab. Oh, I'm very sorry. I'm sorry, Miss Damien. There isn't a cab around. Well, how long do you think it'll be? That's hard to say. Are you sure you don't want to lift? Well, there doesn't seem to be any alternative. Good night, Mr. Garrett. Good night, Mr. Cortland. A 
I wasn't very polite, was I? Neither was Garrett, for that matter. Oh, he always enjoys uncomfortable situations. Do you still feel uncomfortable? No. Frankly, I don't. Good, nor do I. You know, you're not at all what I imagined. No? No. The big international jeweler. <laughs> I happen to inherit a business that runs itself very nicely. As a matter of fact, you don't look like an art editor. More like a work of art. That layout on your jewels is still a wretched piece of copy. I can only admire your good taste. And I'm still not going to... I wouldn't try and persuade you for the world. Mr. Courtland, I think you're a very dangerous man. I only wish it was so. The truth is, I'm a very ordinary one. I'm sorry, I forgot to give you my address. It's my fault, I forgot to ask you. Won't you come in for a minute? Uh, no, I don't think so. Oh, but you really must see those jewels you've been insulting. They're much handsomer than the photographs. I'll need you in about 15 minutes. But I said I wasn't coming in. Oh, yes, so you did. not so hard to take once you get the hang of it. I think I know all the troubles that come with money. And all the pleasures. Well, have you got me all figured out? Only what I see here. Good books, fine pictures. Why don't you ever look at them? Oh, but I do. I'm a lonely bachelor and I spend hours here all by myself poring over old manuscripts. You don't expect me to believe that, do you? Didn't my father paint that? Was Stephen Damien your father? Uh-huh. That's very interesting. Is it? I remember when he came here to paint that picture of my mother. Everybody was fascinated by him, especially mother. Father ended by chasing him out of the house. I'm afraid that's the way it usually ended. My father was very much in love with life. That's a Hungarian custom, isn't it? Uh -huh. Not exclusively Hungarian. Weren't you going to show me your jewels? Oh, yes, of course. I'd quite forgotten. That's the reason we came in here, wasn't it? You ought to feel very flattered, Miss Damien. This safe is one of my darkest secrets. Do you really want to see those jewels? Not particularly. I can't tell a brilliant from a diamond. Not one person in a hundred can. But then very few people are intelligent enough to admit it. Thank you. How about another drink? No, thanks. You know, you need relaxing. Lots of relaxing. I can hear your nerves snapping like rubber bands. I'm not nervous at all, see? You're a very curious mixture. A highly moral voice. That's not me, that's my mind. A man's mind, I'd say. Why not? I do a man's work. And desperate eyes. Eyes full of shadows. Insomnia, that's that. Does it? Dean? Miss Damien, give me her secretary. Miss Damien's office? No, Mr. Cortland, she's not here yet. Shall I have her call you? Yes, Mr. Cortland. Where's Glamourpuss? She hasn't come in yet. Well, who sent these? Mr. Felix Cortland. Mr. Cortland? Very interesting. She never misses, does she? Mm-hmm. Jealous. If I'd given it any thought, I could have predicted it. Gladys, I won my bet. She's got a new boyfriend. I guess those dames gotta have no excitement all the time. Yeah, here today, gone tomorrow. Personally, I don't see what she sees it at all. Is that any concern of yours? No, Miss Damien. I didn't hire you to gossip about my private life. No, Miss Damien. Go get your money. You're through. Damien. 
you come in yet? <laughs> What's the matter, sweetheart? Miss Damien fired me. Fired you? What for? He heard me talking about Mr. Cortland. Cortland, eh? Don't you worry, baby. I'll fix that. I understand you fired June. That's right. What's the idea? I don't like people to gossip about me. You don't, eh? No, I don't. Well, it's pretty late to be thinking about a thing like that and so rotten quick to take it out on your secretary. Get out of here. You don't think your life is a secret, do you? Boys were betting eight to five this morning that the court and layout would be in the next issue. You're disgusting. Madeline, why don't you get wise to yourself? Everybody else is. One romance after another, that's your whole life and you adore it. Get out. You try to dress it up with pretty words, but you don't fool anybody. They know what you are, and you'll never change. Get out! You don't care because it's too much fun. It isn't true. It isn't true. It isn't true! I'm mean, a little surprised. Here's a beautiful woman. He just doesn't care what happens to him. Many women haven't the courage to face themselves. So they look for escape in one excitement after another. Perhaps you find the idea of living not very attractive. If you want to kill yourself, why don't you try the bridge? I'm glad I was right. An intelligent woman, not an idiot. Sit down. That's it. Now, if you feel like talking, just go ahead and talk. You're afraid, aren't you? Well, it's our job to find out why. To explore the shadows and throw light on what we find there. Then you'll be able to see yourself clearly and face yourself honestly. When you can do that, you won't be afraid anymore. I was living with my father. Mother had left him before we came to America. I was ten, and to me, the way he lived seemed romantic and wonderful. He was a successful painter, and women adored him. He went his own way and did what he pleased. Just as you've been trying to do? I suppose so. But why? Did it make him so very happy? Oh, I was certain he was the happiest man in the world, until until he killed himself. And you couldn't understand why he did it. You understand now? I think I do. Did you ever do any painting yourself? I used to. Why'd you give it up? Oh, didn't pay enough. And besides, I didn't want to be like my father. I wanted my own life. And have you been living your own life? Of course I have. The kind of life you really want? I don't know. I don't know. Don't you think you've been hiding from yourself? Did you ever try and discover the person you really were deep down underneath? I never cared to. I'm not so sure I do now. In that case, I'm afraid I can't help you. But of course, that's entirely up to you. Shall we go on then? I was doing what I wanted to do. Paying my own way and making my own rules. And nobody was hurt. Nobody but yourself. And it didn't really make you happy, did it? Wasn't that because down underneath you knew there was something missing? Something important? I suppose so. That would worry you, wouldn't it? And then you would drug yourself with the excitement of more excitement. Oh, I know the pattern, Miss Damien. You're suffering from a disease of the times. A neurotic malady as commonplace as chronic alcoholism. Suppose for a moment that you were an alcoholic. They're much the same, you know. Unsure of themselves underneath. 
and seeking reassurance from new excitement. Instead of getting at the cause, the drunkard solves his problem by taking another drink. This, of course, is no solution. And eventually, we find him sprawled hopelessly at a bar, without the strength or even the desire to save himself. I can't go on with this. You're not helping me. You're insulting me. You've been insulting yourself, Miss Damien. Insulting your body and insulting your soul. Your life hasn't been gay and glamorous at all. It's just been muddled and senseless. You know that now. And if you really want to change it, you can start right away. Now it's up to you. You can have my apartment, Ethel. The rent's paid till the end of the month. Darling, I feel like a vulture, wheeling over your head. I'm not in, whoever it is. Miss Damien's office. <laughs> no, no, she still hasn't come in, Mr. Corson. Well, I don't know exactly. Later in the day, I... Did he hang up? Yes, good. Let me call him back, darling. You may be sorry later. Everything in this pile returned without comment. This I would ask to see more of their work, and these you may be able to use. But you haven't given me your new address. I'm not giving it to anyone. Hello, Madeline. Beautiful, would you mind popping out for a minute? That's just 60 seconds. You better talk fast. Madeline, I'm on a jam. I've got to raise some money. I need about $5,000. What do you expect me to do about it? Well, I thought you might talk to Cortland. I'm sure he'd let you have it if you ask him nicely. You're really quite a rat, aren't you? Look, Madeline, I'm in debt up to here. I only make $100 a week, and you know I can't live on that. $5,000 doesn't mean a thing to Cortland. You better get out of here before I lose my temper. You're forcing me to say things that I don't want to say, but if you're going to act cold and virtuous about it, you'll hear them. Suppose I tell Cranish. Tell him what? About Cortland. You know, you've got a very nice job here, but you won't have it very long if I tell Cranish. I don't want to tell him, but... <laughs> What's so funny? As a blackmailer, you are pitiful. Go on, tell him. Tell him what a rat I am, and you are, and he is. Go on, use my phone if you want, and my desk, and my office. I'm through with all of them. Boulevard magazine. No, Miss Damien hasn't been back. Just a moment, please. I'm sorry, she doesn't work here anymore. You might try at her home. Waldorf Apartments. Waldorf Apartments? Miss Damien? Oh, no, uh, she gave up her apartment. Uh, why don't you try the post office? Dalton? 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 Damien. Herr Richard Caleb, 137 West 50th Street. Well, I've nothing to do except that Miss Damien has taken my advice as a doctor. She'd been living in an area of infection, and she's removed herself from it. I take it you consider me part of the general contamination. Now, you've come here for information, not diagnosis. I usually charge a fee for insulting people. I'm willing to pay for data of any kind. Yes, I gathered that, but I have nothing for sale. I suppose you're being very ethical, but I'd like to talk to Madeline in your presence if you wish. Miss Damien is living under a different name in a different world. She told me to tell you, if you inquired, that she was busy growing a new soul. Now, would you please keep off the grass? Goodbye, Mr. Cortland. Goodbye, Doctor. Doesn't it ever worry you, playing the Almighty in this fashion? Not particularly. I'm used to it. more cheerful. You know, like flowers and butterflies. I'll do that. Thank you, Mrs. Geiger. I 
thanks. You saved my life. Is this yours? Yes. Mrs. Geiger would scout me if she knew I kept mice in my room. Well, why do you keep mice in your room? Hmm? Oh, uh, pathologist, part of my homework. I really shouldn't bring these fellas out of the lab, but, well, I got kind of attached to this one. Oh, thanks again. Hey. Women are supposed to scream. Aren't you afraid of mice? Well, no. But next time I'll scream. Good afternoon, Miss Green. Hello, how's the work going? Oh, all right, I think. Come in. Hello. Hello. Say, so you're an artist, aren't you? Well, I don't know. Oh, Mrs. Geiger said yesterday that you were. She's an authority, if I ever saw one. I was wondering, could you do a job for me? Want your portrait painted? For me? Oh, no. No, nothing like that. I'm doing some research, and it has to be illustrated. Oh. What do you want me to draw? Mm, nothing fancy, just blood cells and uh, things. Sounds fascinating. Oh, it is, really. You see, it's a lot like... Oh, no, no, you'd be surprised. It really is fascinating once you get in it. Of course, I'm on a fellowship, and I couldn't pay you very much. Matter of fact, I, uh, I couldn't pay anything till the first of the month. That'll be all right. Oh, fine. Swell, so I'll settle then. I'll see you in my place about 6 o'clock. Oh, but I... Couldn't I... Oh, sure you can. I just live downstairs. You know, the mousetrap. Oh, uh, by the way, my name is Cousins. Uh, mine is Dixon. Very glad to know you, Miss Dixon. <laughs> Just what am I drawing? Am I allowed to find out? Sure. Back to any reticular serum on cell tissue. That's all I wanted to know. Oh, say, say, that's quite good. I'll take it to the lab with me in the morning. I'm just about ready for the next one. Do you realize it's 12 o'clock? Oh? I haven't had my dinner yet. And you haven't either. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry, but well, I, get, I got so wound up on this. <laughs> so did I, but now I'm hungry. Well, i tell you what let's do. We'll go out and eat. That's a brilliant idea. I'll get your coat. Do you do this all the time? Only since I got out of the Army. I was lucky to get this job of research. Now I've got to get it finished. Then what? Oh, then I go back to Oregon and become the usual respectable small-town doctor. No mice? No. No mice. Head colds and belly aches. Five dollars a visit. Maybe you'll like it. You'll get some rest. Oh, I'll get plenty of rest, all right, but I don't think I'll like it. You folks going out this time of night? That's right. We're meeting a few friends at the Busy Bee Cafeteria. We don't want to miss the floor show. We'll have to hurry. See that he eats. He hasn't got any more sense than a goose. I'll feed him with a spoon. I got onto it first up in a little town in Germany while I was still in the Army. I met a couple of Russian medical officers who were working on that in particular, and well, they were pretty steamed up about it. Kaiser? No, no thanks. We got together the first night over a bottle of vodka. I remember the town was still burning. Well, maybe it was the vodka, but it, anyhow, we got to talking about anti-reticular, and, well, I guess I got pretty excited. You mean you speak Russian? Over a bottle of vodka, anybody speaks Russian. Can I have some coffee? No, thanks, I have milk. Oh, uh, one, please. At any rate, I promised myself that night that just as soon as the war was over, I was going to do a job of this. But you haven't stopped to eat ever since. That's an error I'm just about to rectify. One dollar even. Thank you. Oh, thank you. You uh, sure you've got everything you want? Oh, yes, thanks. You know, I don't think you're much of a doctor. Do you call this a sensible diet, pancakes and pickles? Well, scientifically, there's two kinds of diets. The kind that doctors prescribe and the uh, stuff they eat themselves. Oh, but you're always in such a rush. You can't make scientific discoveries that way. Sure you can. Take Benny. He saw some flies nibbling in a piece of pancreas. Figured out that there must be sugar in, and in one minute he had the idea for insulin. 
You know, you're a very lovely girl. You're not being very scientific, Doctor. Oh, but I am. It's the very heart of science. It's the truth. Let's talk about insulin. Insulin. Script covers? Yes, are they all right? Oh, sure, sure, they're fine. How much they cost? Oh, nothing at all. Something like 20 cents. Oh, nothing at all, huh? You know, you can buy a pair of good mice for 20 cents. <laughs> David, I have some wonderful news. I just sold a picture. No fooling. Mm -hmm. Who bought it? The floor walker downstairs. He said it's almost as good as a photograph. Well, the man has great taste. <laughs> oh, I think it's wonderful. I'm proud of you. And uh, I'm a little proud of myself, too. David Cousins on Auntie Reticula. Oh, David, it looks fine. It's important, isn't it? I mean, not just to you, but really important. Well, it, it won't cure all the ills of man or beast, but... Yes. Yes, I, I think it may be important. And I also think that I better hand it in before I start changing it again. Like to come along? Oh, could I? Well, sure, why not? I think you've been drawing blood cells long enough. It's time now for you to meet one of them face to face. text is as good as your illustrations. I hope so, too, sir. Well, that's that. You didn't tell him there were your drawings, did you? I didn't tell him they weren't. <laughs> Come on, I'll show you my lap. Hmm, coffee. <laughs> I wouldn't try and drink it if I were you. <laughs> Assistant pathologist. Well, this is me. How do you like it? Oh, I think it's wonderful. But how do you find anything in this place? <laughs> Been here for six months and I haven't lost anything yet. Doesn't matter anyway. The boss okays my research. I'll be out of here in a week. Back to Oregon? Yes, back to Oregon. All that way just to make a living. Is it as bad as all that? Oh, what's the use in kidding, Madeline? I'm so much in love with you, I can't see straight. I haven't done any work in here for days. I just sit around waiting until I can see you. I know. Because that's just what I do, wait to see you. Darling. Oh, darling, I... I never felt like this about anyone before. Tell me, when did you first know? Oh, when I first saw you, I think. Yeah, me too. I'll never forget you standing in that hall with a mouse in your hand. Only I, I didn't know then what was happening. I thought I had the flu. Will you marry me? Oh, David. Well, will you? We don't know each other. I mean, you don't know me. Oh, but I do. Of course I know you. Now, what do you want to know about me? David Cousins, M.D., University of Oregon, Captain Medical Corps Reserve, young, healthy, and very much in love. Will you marry me? Oh, please don't ask me now. Well, I've got to ask you now. I want to marry you now. Please give me time, David. I'm all mixed up. I'd like to go home now. All right.
haven't answered a rather important question I asked you. I can't say no, because I wouldn't mean it. Oh, darling. David, I do love you. Good night, darling. Good night. Hadn't you better close the door? A gentleman I hired provided me with your new address and the proper keys. Suppose someone had seen you. You wouldn't have cared, would you? I didn't think it mattered. You see, I expected to find you wretched and lonely, grappling with your complexes. Rather naive of me. Will you please go? Of course I'll go. But before I do, wouldn't you like to tell me about him? Why? I'm in love. Now, laugh if you want. I don't feel like laughing. I've always wondered if it were possible for people like you and me. And you think you've really got it? Love eternal, the fireside, the slippers, the whole thing? Yes, the whole thing. I'm very glad for you. And I think I'm a little sad for myself. You haven't told him, have you? Told him what? Well, about, about me, for instance. But why should I tell him? You're absolutely right, you shouldn't. Men prefer to keep their illusions, don't they? Please go. If you ever need me, you let me know, won't you? And don't call the past too many names. <laughs> you say I'm going to marry him just as soon as it can be arranged you want to run away from your problem I'm not running away no you know you're looking for security from someone else instead of building it within yourself but I love him I can't talk to you if you don't believe me falling in love doesn't cure everything overnight what do you mean let's be honest there's a side of you that hasn't fully changed isn't that true that is true isn't it You've still not told David about yourself? I couldn't tell him. You let him fall in love with an illusion, with someone who doesn't exist. I could never tell him. He might stop loving me. Isn't that a risk you'll have to take? You're being very careless about it. You can't build a lifetime relationship on a lie. If you're really in love, you'll tell him. With the others, it was different. But if you love him... Will you please stop saying if? How many times must I tell you I love him? But real love is a sharing. If you're strong enough to face this yourself, you're strong enough to face it with David. Oh, I can't do it. I can't risk the only happiness I've ever had. That's up to you, Miss Damien. Darling, you're home early, aren't you? Well, I didn't get fired, if that's what you mean. Dr. Lutz read my paper. Really? What did he say? Well, he, uh, he liked it. Oh, David, that's wonderful. The only trouble is, he thinks it's so important, he wants me to go to Chicago and read it before the convention. Oh, David, no. Well, that's not my idea. I don't want to go. Well, when will you have to leave? Tonight. Got to catch the 8 o'clock plane. And when will you come back? Oh, I don't know. A few days. But I'll tell you what. As soon as I get back, let's get married. You can get a license in three days, and it only takes 15 minutes to get married. You still want to marry me, don't you? Oh, more than anything in the world. You know, I'm going to feel kind of silly at that convention. Of course, it's a great honor and all that, but... You realize that I'll be talking before some of the biggest men in the field? 
What's the matter, darling? Nothing. I was just thinking how I'd feel if you didn't love me. Oh, don't be silly. Not a chance. David, could you ever stop loving me? Oh, that's really a gruesome thought. Of course not. Even, even if there was a reason? The world is bothering you. Nothing. I just wanted to be sure. Sure about what? That you loved me and not a, an illusion you built up about me. Scientists can't believe in illusions. I believe in you. You're the best thing that's ever happened to me. Of course, shoots. I wonder if that'll be enough. I don't think of it, it'll have to be. That's all I've got. Socks? Well, just about does it. Madeline, was there something special on your mind? Something that you wanted to tell me? Just that I love you, that's all. Every day? Every day. Hope you miss me. Hope you suffer like a maniac. I will, I promise. Oh, gosh, I hate to leave you. You know, I'm going to be jealous. Jealous of what? Oh, I don't know. Nobody, everybody. Just jealous. Darling, I belong to you. Don't you know that? I'm only alive because you love me. We'll be married the minute I get back. Well, look who's here. If it isn't Madeline. How are you? It's been a long time. David, this is Mr. Garrett. I used to work with him on a magazine. Howdy, Garrett. I quit the racket, though. Or perhaps the racket quit me. Garrett's doing some confidential work for me now. How are you, Miss Dixie? This is Mr. Cortland, David. Dr. Cousins, my fiancé. You're a very lucky man, Doctor. Well, I think so. Well, uh, goodbye, Miss Dixon. My congratulations to you both. Oh, thank you. Good night. Good night. I don't believe a minute of it, do you? Garrett, you're a very cynical man. You don't believe in true love. You don't think Madeline does either, do you? I don't know, but I've always been fascinated by miracles. Come in. Telegram for you, Miss Dixon. I thought I'd bring it up myself. I thought it might be important. The news? Uh, he won't be back till Friday. That's men for you. You never can count on them. Oh, I forgot. A doctor somebody called you said you were to call Miss Ethel Royce. She's been trying to get in touch with you. Friend of yours? Yes. I suppose you got your own reasons. But you ought to get out and see your friends. Instead of sitting in this room all day and all night. Thanks, Mrs. Geiger. None of my business, mind you. This is Madeline. Madeline! Darling! But this is really a voice from the dead. I pestered that doctor of yours for hours. I just have to talk to you. Well, what about? Will you remember that art supplement, the one you started? Well, I do need your help, dear. I'm in an awful mess. Sorry, dear. I'll never come into that office again as long as I live. Oh, but I wouldn't ask you to do that. Just meet me somewhere. It'll only take an hour, I promise. Well, if it's just the two of us, all right. I'll be there at five. Oh, so relieved. We were really desperate. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm just dying to see you. Bye, dear. <laughs> She'll do it. Good. Wonderful thing, professional pride. It never dies. <sighs> How'd you sound? Awful. What do you expect? Too bad. Victor, I don't want you to be there. Wouldn't think of spoiling your reunion, my dear. <laughs> I don't trust Madeline. Doctor or no doctor. No, you either, my sweet. Hello, Miss Damien. Glad to see you back. Glad to see you, Jim. Hello, Luigi. Is Miss Royce here? She just came in, Miss Damien. We missed you, Miss Damien. Have you been away? No, but it's nice to be back just the same. Hello, Ethel. Darling, you look wonderful. A little pale, but so interesting. You know, I can't stay very long. Oh, I understand, dear. We'll get right to work. The usual, Miss Damien? Well, I don't know, Carl. You'd better. Wait till you see the mess I'm in with the supplements. All right, Carl. Darling, I'm just dying to hear what you've been up to. You must tell me everything. 
but there's nothing to tell. Come on, let's go to work. You're just marvelous, my dear. You made the whole project seem utterly simple and practical. Not for me, please. Darling, you used to be able to drink ten in a row. I'm out of training. <laughs> no one would know it, my dear. You seem just like the old Madeleine again. It's the surroundings. What do you say we have dinner and go to a show? No, really, I I've got to stagger home. Madeleine, my dear, this is a surprise. Victor, hello. What good fortune running into you like this? Do you mind? Don't let no. us fool you, Madeline. We heard me making the date with you. It's true, but I'll deny it. Frankly, I wanted to have a look at you. You look very dashing for a hermit. Thank you. We've all missed you desperately, haven't we, Ethel? As though our little hearts would break. What about a drink with your old boss? Three, I had three, yes. whatever it is. I've got all the data we need on the supplement. Good. What about the data on Madeline? No data. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll really... You can't go now. Look who you'll run into. He's seen you. Mr. Garrett no longer graces our staff. What happened? He got to be utterly gritty. Say nothing of a slight discrepancy in his accounts. Mr. Garrett believes that the world owes him a gay life, no matter who pays for it. Well, hello, stranger. How are you? Wonderful. Nobody here seems particularly glad to see me. Should we be? Oh, well, it's been nice knowing you. There goes one reason for my ivory tower. What? Darling, I'm constantly running into men who adore you. Slews of them. Hated them all. I know what you're thinking. I had an odd way of expressing my distaste. Not odd, darling. Shall we say just, uh, moody? Well, here's to memory. May I speak to Mr. Cordon, please? Just a moment, sir. Just a minute. Sir. All right. Hello, Garrett. I have some interesting news. Do you know who's here? Madeline. How considerate of you to call. By the way, I've just been through the stones in my safe and one's missing. The stones are not terribly important, but you're the only person who knows about my safe, and the fact is you did have my keys for quite a while yesterday. What are you getting at? Only that I don't like thieves. But you're being ridiculous. Let me come over and talk about it. There's nothing to talk about. I'm taking it up with the police. But, Cordons, you can't do that. Mr. Garrett again, sir. Tell him I've gone out. I'm sorry, Mr. Cortland has just left. It's raining. Let me drive you home. Oh, no. Ethel wouldn't approve. Good luck, my dear, in your treetop. Bye, darling. Well? Let's face it. She's a changed woman. <laughs> She'll never change, darling. She's just got herself a new set of words, that's all. I'm waiting for a cab. Don't be silly. There are no cabs. You'll get drenched. Please. I'll drop you off. I'm going home alone. Come on, in you get. I hope you didn't get too wet. Your concern is touching. Quite a coincidence finding you in the rain. Is it? I can't lie to you, especially when there's no point to it. 
I was informed you were playing hooky. You're detestable. I'm really not detestable at all. I happen to be very fond of beauty, which shouldn't be a crime in your eyes. Please, no debates. I, I'm a little dizzy. A good dinner will soon take care of that. Why do you always hound me? You know I despise you and everything you stand for. There's always a chance I may be able to improve your opinion and your manners. I'm sleepy. You know you're very lovely. Please don't bother. I'm not listening. Don't you remember? You visited here once upon a time. You're foul. You said you were taking me home. You forgot to mention the subject. A significant omission, as your friend Freud would say. Come on, I'm getting soaked. That launch you. I'm going home. Right after dinner. Think how wonderful you'll feel when you slap my face. That'll take the chill out of your bones, and maybe even your heart. Still cold? Oh, no. It's quite warm in here. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> Very warm. Light? No, I'm not really detestable, am I? No. I am. Why? Because I ought to go home. In this rain, you mustn't even think of it. You see, you are detestable. And you've been very annoying for months. <laughs> Madeleine, we belong together, you know that. No, I don't know of that. Of course you do. We feel the same way about you life. You're not making sense, Mr. Court. Why make sense? Doesn't this make more sense than talking and lying? No sense at all. Then what would you call it, darling? Stupid. Madeleine, you're wonderful. Stupid. You're sweeter than Stupid. ever. Stupid. I'd better see who it is. I tell you, I'm going to raise the money. I'll pay you, honestly. I don't like dealing with thieves. That's a job for the police. You swear out a warrant, you'll never get a dime. Look, I didn't sell it. I just had to have some money temporarily. Here's the pawn ticket. I'm not interested in pawn tickets. Good night, But, Carter, you've got to give me a chance. I said good night. Explain this, you stupid fool. You have the stone back. I'll get it to you. I promise I will. All I need is a little more time, just a couple of weeks. What are you doing? Phoning the police. You can't do that. I'm not going to let you ruin me. You wasn't expected back until Friday. That's what I like, a cheery welcome home. Is Dixon upstairs? I haven't seen her this morning. Who is it? I just said my little piece and ran out on them. Oh, I needed you so badly. I'd be lost without you. Don't ever leave me again. Oh, that you can depend on. Mm -hmm. Say, I've got big news. I'm a success. Oh, tell me all about it. What the world's the matter with you? You don't look very good. Come on, I think you better get back in bed. 
Now then, first, I don't have to go back to belly aches in Oregon. You're not marrying a small town country doctor, young lady. You're marrying a promising young research scientist. At least that's what Dr. Broder says, and he ought to know. He's got a long white beard. Oh, darling, I'm so proud of you. I think I'll take your temperature. Gee, I wish you could have been there. When I finished reading my paper, they all got together and offered me my own laboratory in California. I still can't believe it. There it is, right in the paper. You'll find it on the bottom of page 10. Said Madeline. Madeline, what's the matter? Oh, David. Oh, darling, you're cold as ice. You've got a chill. You stay right here. I'll be back in a minute. Oh, don't go. Don't leave me. I'll only be a second. I want to get a hot water bottle and some more blankets. Is Miss Madeline Dixon at home? I don't know. Friends of hers? We're from police headquarters. Where's her room? Upstairs. What do you want to see Miss Dixon about? We'll tell her. Perhaps you'd better tell me first. Miss Dixon isn't well. Who are you? He's a doctor. He lives here. If it isn't important, I suggest you come back tomorrow. It's important. Could you get some extra blankets and a hot water bottle, please? Are you a friend of Miss Dixon's? Yes, why? Just asking. Well, what is it, an accident or something? I wouldn't call it an accident. Well, we should cut out this mystery and tell me what it's all about. Okay, Doc, take it easy. Madeline. These men are from the police. They want to We'll take over from here, Doc. I'm Sergeant Batelli. This is Sergeant Beitler. You were a friend of Felix Cortland's, weren't you? Matter of fact, you were with him last night. No, no, I wasn't. Did you see Mr. Cortland at any time yesterday? No, I didn't. Now, look, Miss Damien, we wouldn't be here asking questions unless we already knew most of the answers. Oh, wait a minute. Her name's not Damien. I think you've got the wrong party. I think maybe you've got the wrong party, Doc. Her name happens to be Damien. This happens to be a case of murder. Take a look at that newspaper. I want to know what's going on in here. This is my house, and I've got to know. Sorry, madam, we'll talk to you later. As long as I've been here, there's never been police Take in this house. Take her and see what you can Come find on, out, lady. Come on. Now, Miss Damien, tell us what happened last night. What time did you leave Cortland's house? Oh, Dave. You and this guy, Cortland, were pretty sweet on each other, isn't that right? Oh, but it isn't. It isn't true. Now, according to the chauffeur, you got to Cortland's house at quarter to seven. What time did you leave? Oh, but I didn't go into the house. I, I met him by accident. David, don't look at me like that. How long have you known Miss Damien, Doc? Not very long, only a few months. Know that she was mixed up with this guy, Cortland? Oh, but it's a lie, David, it's a lie. Okay, so he didn't go into the house with Cortland? No, I didn't. He wanted me to come to the house, but I, I wouldn't do it. Oh, I didn't go into the house. I didn't, I tell you. Who are you telling, me or the doc here? Did you get anything? She came in about nine. In a cab? No, she was walking in the rain. Landlady said she looked kind of wild-eyed. What about Cortland? He was here, all right. He visited her a couple of weeks ago. Get the date? Yeah, April 10th, around midnight. Anything else? The landlady thought that Cortland had a key to this place. She was kind of vague as to how he got it. I didn't give him a key. David, you can't believe that. I've got his key ring here. This one fits. He had a key, all right. But I didn't give it to him. Where are you going? Oh, David, don't leave me. I didn't kill him, I swear. I didn't kill him. Who cares whether you killed him or not? Could I see him for just a minute? Well, it isn't regulations. Okay, 60 seconds. David, please listen to me. You lied to me. You've always lied to me. But I'm not lying now. I didn't want to go with him. He said he'd drive me home. And he made love to you, didn't he? Oh, don't deny it. Of course he made love to you. He had a key to your room. I should have told you many things. I tried to, but I, I just couldn't. If this thing were so innocent, you would have told me. When I said I was in love with you. When I asked you to marry me. I was afraid, David. I was afraid you wouldn't understand. You bet I wouldn't. Before I met you, I... I was horrible. But you changed all that. You made me sane and happy. Why keep on lying? You tried that upstairs and it didn't work. Look, I was in love with you. All right, I made a mistake. I thought you were something wonderful and you turned out to be something else. 
so let's just forget about it. The only thing that you can do for me is let me alone. I love you, David. I'll always love you. So, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the prosecution will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that Madeline Damien is guilty of the premeditated murder of Felix Corton. We will prove that she was in his apartment the night he was murdered. We will prove that her fingerprints are on the table lighter with which he was murdered. And we will prove further that she had a motive for the murder. For after all, this is a very simple story. To one man, Dr. Cousins, she was a pure and noble woman. To the other, Felix Cortland, an irresponsible light of love. Too self-indulgent to be faithful to the man she wanted to marry. Too weak and lacking in character to break with Cortland. Her twisted soul was bent on a heartless deceit. To make one man believe what all others knew to be a lie. And when Corton threatened to expose her, she went to his apartment to plead with him in the only way she knew. She embraced him. She made love to him. And when in spite of that, he threatened to expose the lie that she was living, she silenced him forever. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the state asks you to find Madeline Damien guilty guilty of murder in the first degree. On the night Mr. Corton called on the defendant, did you let him into her apartment? I certainly did not. How did he get in then? He must have had a key of his own. The key of his own? Where was the defendant when he arrived? Out of the doctor, I suppose, pulling the wool over his eyes. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Geiger. Your witness, Mr. Mitchell. You've got to let me cross-examine her. No questions. Miss Damien, I can't defend you properly if you won't let me. We've got to put up a fight. Fight? What for? And now, Mr. Garrett, just what was the nature of the work you did for Mr. Cortman? Well, most of it was personal. Confidential secretary, I suppose you'd call it. And in that capacity, you were in a position to learn a great deal about his private life? Yes, of course. Did Mr. Corton know that Miss Damien was lying to Dr. Cousins and concealing her true character from him? I'd rather not answer that question, Mr. O'Brien. You see, both Miss Damien and Mr. Corton were, were friends of mine. Yes, I understand. But let's get back to the meeting at the airport. What was the attitude of the defendant when Corton saw Dr. Cousins? She was embarrassed, naturally. Yeah. She was embarrassed, naturally. Thank you. Your witness, Mr. Mitchell. I've got to cross-examine. If I don't, we haven't a chance. Don't ask him anything. No questions. Were you a close friend of the defendant? Yes, I was. Did she confide in you on matters of a personal nature? Yes, she did. If you were asked in this court, do you think you could recall any of those intimacies? I could recall some of them in uh, Laura Detail. Your Honor, I object. Objection sustained. Well, let me ask you this, Miss Royce. Would you say in general that men found Miss Damien attractive? Definitely. And would you say that Miss Damien found men attractive to her? I'm afraid I most certainly would. You would? What were the relations between Miss Damien and her former employer, Mr. Cranish? They were, uh, friendly. In your opinion, was there anything more than friendly? I object, Your Honor. The question calls for the conclusion of the witness and is prejudicial. Objection sustained. Cousins. I'm Dr. Caleb. Miss Damien's a patient of mine. I don't happen to think she's guilty of murder, do you? No, I don't. She may be guilty of other things, but in there she's being tried for murder. And she won't even defend herself. 
got a pretty good lawyer, hasn't she? She needs your help, Doctor. In her own mind, she's not on trial for murder. She's on trial for those other things. And it's not the judge who's trying that case, it's you. I don't want to be rude, Doctor, but I don't think you know what you're talking about. I'm sorry to disagree. You see, I've been treating Miss Damien for some time. I happen to be her psychiatrist. Dr. Caleb. I'm sorry to have bothered you, Doctor. come of her own free will? Yes, of course. Isn't it true, Doctor, that people do not go to a psychiatrist unless they consider themselves, well, shall we say, not well balanced? In general, that's correct. As a matter of fact, wasn't Miss Damien on the verge of committing suicide when she made her first visit to you? Your Honor, I object. Well, no matter. We'll prove that by other witnesses. However, is it not true that people who come to you as patients come with problems? Objection. Objection overruled. Well, Doctor, there'd be no point in their coming to me if they didn't have problems. So the defendant came to you with a problem. Do you mind telling us, Doctor, in your opinion, just what was Miss Damien's problem? That is a confidential matter between doctor and patient. I'm afraid I can't discuss it. Well, during the course of your treatment of Miss Damien, did you ever discuss her relationship with Dr. David Cousins? Yes, we did. Well, bearing in mind the fact that she's engaged to be married to Dr. Cousins. Do you think she was as frank with him as she should have been? As a matter of fact, I urged her to tell him everything. And did she? Not to my knowledge. Well, why not, Doctor? Why didn't she? I'm afraid you'll have to ask Miss Damien about that. Did you ever meet Dr. Cousins? Yes, just a few minutes ago. Well, I'm sure you found him a reasonable, intelligent young man. And yet the defendant refused to confide in him. Having met Dr. Cousins, I think I can see why Miss Damien hesitated to confide in him. Do you mind telling us why? It's my impression that Dr. Cousins hasn't the capacity, either emotionally or intellectually, to understand a problem like Miss Damien's. How's the trial going, Doctor? Not very well, I'm afraid. There's a Dr. Cousins in your office. Oh? You said you weren't expecting him. As a matter of fact, I was expecting him. Hello, Doctor. Sit down, sit down, relax. Tell me, is this a professional or a social call? Dr. Caleb, you said some pretty rough things about me this afternoon. Yes, I did, didn't I? I think I'm entitled to an explanation. So do I. As a matter of fact, I'm very glad you came over. I wanted to talk to you about Miss Damien. I'm not interested in Miss Damien. I'm glad to see you're still in love with her. And I'm not in love with her. All the better. Then we can approach the subject of Miss Damien as one scientist to another. You see, I'm interested in Miss Damien because she's a patient of mine. I believe I was well on the way to solving her problem. It would be most distressing to me if she were to die now for a crime she didn't commit. It would be as though you had lost one of your white mice, one that you had just inoculated. What's all this got to do with me? Only this, that when you testify tomorrow, you'll be asked to tell the truth, the whole truth. The whole truth about a human soul is a complicated proposition. Now, I'm not going to tell you anything about Miss Damien that you haven't already heard. But isn't it possible that you've picked up a few stray facts and added them up to a conclusion that's entirely wrong? Won't you sit down, Doctor? their last witness, you've got to let me put you on the stand. I tell you quite frankly, Miss Damien, if you won't testify, we haven't got a chance. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth and all the truth, nothing but the truth to help you guide? I do. Please be seated. Your name, please. 
David Cousins. Under what name did you know the defendant? Madeline Dixon. Did she ever tell you her true name? No, sir. Did she ever lie to you about her identity? Yes, sir. How long did she continue to lie to you? Till the morning the police came. Did she ever tell you about her relations with Coffin? No, she didn't. You proposed marriage to the defendant and she accepted you? Yes, sir. And still she didn't tell you about Coffin? No, sir. When did you first know the true relationship between them? The same morning, the morning the police came. Oh, I see. And from the moment you met her until the day she was taken into custody, you didn't know the truth about her character. I object, Your Honor. Mr. O'Brien, haven't you covered your point? Well, Your Honor, I'm merely trying to clarify for the jury the true nature of the defendant's motive. Proceed. Back. One more question, Dr. Cousins. If you had known the truth, would it have affected your love for the defendant? Your Honor, I must protest. Let him answer. Objection withdrawn. And now, Dr. Cousins, if you had known the truth, would it have affected your love for the defendant? I was in love with Miss Damien then, and I'm in love with her now. Your witness, Mitchell. No questions. Did you really mean it? Yes, I really meant it. I can't believe it. Now will you let me put you on the stand? You admit you went to Cortland's apartment that night? Yes. He made love to you? Yes. Did you have any conversations about Dr. Cousins? No. Positive? Yes, I am. But tell me, Miss Damien, were you in love with Felix Cortland? No, I wasn't. Were you in love with Dr. Cousins? Yes. Oh. But you went to Carter's apartment nevertheless. Yes, I told you that. You were in love with one man, yet you chose to visit the apartment of a man you didn't love. Did you go of your own free will? Yes. Mr. Carter didn't force you or threaten you? No. Then why did you visit him? I don't know. I, I made a mistake. <laughs> you made a mistake. As you've told us on several occasions that you and Mr. Carton were interrupted by a mysterious intruder, can you tell this jury anything definite about that person? Anything at all? No, I didn't see him. You didn't see him? I only heard his voice. You seemed very certain it was a man. It was a man. What did he say? Well, I don't know. They were talking in the hall. I, I, I couldn't tell what they were saying. Yes, you heard a voice. You were willing to swear it was a man, and you couldn't hear what he said. Now, what sort of a person do you think would be calling at that time of night? A bill collector? A man selling magazines? Or perhaps even a burglar? Why not a burglar? Mr. Cortland was a very wealthy man. He must have been a very timid burglar because nothing was stolen. Of course, you realize that Mr. Carton kept his jewels in a vault at the store. Not all of them. He kept some at home in his safe. Safe? What safe? The one in his living room. You didn't by any chance see that safe, did you, Miss Damien? Yes, I did. The court, please. This is the first we've heard about a safe. I ask for a recess to examine the apartment. Well, Your Honor, we've been all over the apartment. But if there is a safe and if it has been robbed... Gentlemen, court is adjourned until tomorrow morning. I suggest the district attorney, an attorney for the defendant, Examine the apartment again. What about this safe, Mr. O'Brien? What safe? How about some papers on the inside, Mr. O'Brien? Well, you boys better wait outside. I may have a statement for you when I come out. Mr. O'Brien. Huh? Mind if I tag along? I don't know why you're sure. The fine witness you turned out to be. Couldn't help that, sir. All right, Garrett, where's the safe? Me, Mr. O'Brien? I don't know of any safe in here. I didn't think you did. If you want an unbiased opinion, I don't think there is a safe. Well, here's a learned counsel. Perhaps he knows. Where's the safe, Mitchell? My assistant's checking the location with Miss Damien. He'll be along in a minute. Oh, you're on a dead one. While we're waiting, maybe Mr. Garrett could tell us where the safe is. I've asked him. He doesn't know. I don't understand that, Mr. Garrett. You were very close to Cortland, weren't you? That's right. I'm sure if there's a safe in here, I would have known about it. At least I would have seen the key to it. The answer's very simple. There is no safe. What did you find out? I got the dope on him, Mr. Mitchell. Splendid. It's over here in this bookcase. You were wrong for once, Mr. O'Brien. Could be. What do you know about that? Have you got Cortland's keys? There they are. Thank you. That looks to me very much like a safe, Mr. O'Brien. Yes, it does, doesn't it? But not like a safe that's ever been robbed. I don't think a good burglar would leave those behind. 
Well, I guess we're right back where we started from. Well, I've seen all I want. How about you, Mitchell? You win this round. Lock it up, sir. Yes, sir. See you in court, gentlemen. Can I give you a lift, doctor? No, thanks. Sergeant, I have some papers here, Mr. Cortland, that I'd like to put in order. Do you mind if I stay? It's all right with me. We're finished with the place. Thank you very much. Anything I can do for you, doctor? Oh, I was just curious about something. I've never seen a safe like that before. One that operated with a key. Come to think about it, I guess I haven't either. Normal assumption about a safe is that the lock works on a combination. Mm, yes, I guess most of them do. I was wondering how you knew that this one worked with a key. You said you'd never seen the key to it. Did I say that? Uh-huh. I guess I must have said something I didn't mean. Oh, oh, I see. There could be another explanation. Really? Yes. That you were lying when you said you'd never seen the safe before. <laughs> You're not serious, are you, Doc? I'm a scientist, Mr. Garrett. When we get hold of an odd fact, we consider every possible explanation. We make some of our most important discoveries that way. Well, it must be fascinating work. Yes, it is. Suppose I had known about that safe, which I didn't. What would that prove? Frankly, nothing. But it does suggest a theory. You were very close to Cortland. You knew about the safe. Maybe the safe was robbed. Perhaps he found out about it. He was quarreling with a man in the hall the night he was killed. Maybe that man was you. That's a very interesting theory. Yes, isn't it? Well, as I said, I'm a scientist. When we hit on a theory like that, the next thing we do is to test it. That's all I'm doing. I see. Then you, uh, you won't mind having a little talk with the police? No, no, why should I? Fingerprints. But then, of course, if you've never seen the safe before, you won't mind them checking it for yours. Oh, certainly not. The number is Spring 73100. feelings. Don't you think this sort of thing is rather out of your line, though? I guess maybe you're right. Bye, Doctor. Goodbye. Spring 73100, wasn't it, Mr. Garrett? I guess maybe I underestimated you, Doctor. She's gone. She asked me to give you this. Gone? Well, where did she go? I couldn't get a word out of her, but I know she left the airport more than an hour ago. David, dear, I 
can still hear your voice in that courtroom, and I'll never forget what you said. You did much more than save my life. You made my life worth saving. I can't bear to tell you how much I love you and want to marry you. But right now, that wouldn't be fair. I'm going away for a while. I want to be terribly sure, after all this, that I can really be the kind of person you once thought I was. Maybe, after a while, that will be possible. And then, when we're both sure, David, please ask me again. Goodbye, my darling. try and see him once in a while. Of course. You see, I want to be sure of myself. I'm sure of you. Are you really? After what you've been through, I'm very sure. Goodbye. I still think you're making a mistake. 